Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Miller, and the SCP we're going to be looking at today is SCP-2764, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures SCP-2764 is currently located in Antarctica. All civilians are to be kept outside of a 150-kilometer radius from the object. This radius is to be strictly monitored by Mobile Task Force ETA-5, Containment Battalion 4 Alpha. A perimeter has been established around a radius of 75 kilometers from SCP-2764, and this perimeter is to be guarded by at least 10 guards per 25 kilometers of the circumference at all times, totaling a 190 guard minimum around the entire circumference. If any civilian is caught inside of the 150 kilometer radius, they are to be brought in for questioning, and are to be administered Class A or B amnestics, at the discretion of the on-site supervisor. The civilian in question will then be transported off-site to their most recent dwelling. Should SCP-2764 suddenly flicker outside of the usual radius of 25 kilometers, a new perimeter is to be immediately established at the radius of 75 kilometers and this perimeter shall be held with the usual containment procedures until SCP-2764 returns to its usual position at In the event that the creature flickers to a public location, all civilians are to be immediately evacuated and all known observers of the event will be taken in and administered Class A amnestics. The area should, from there on out, be monitored for any traces of knowledge of SCP-2764 in the populace and civilians suspected to have knowledge about the event are to be monitored very closely and eventually administered Class B amnestics at the earliest convenience. Under absolutely no circumstances is any Foundation employee or civilian to approach closer than 30 kilometers to the creature. If any person is found to have approached closer than this distance, they are to be detained immediately and questioned thoroughly. The person in question is to be given a thorough psychological evaluation and is to then either be administered Class A amnestics or to be terminated after the consideration of their evaluation. Description SCP-2764 is a massive biological entity of unknown origin. Its height measures to be approximately 382 meters and is estimated to weigh over 150,000 metric tons. The entity possesses between 75 and 85 tentacular appendages extending from the ventral region of its body. It uses this mass of tendrils for both movement and simple utility actions such as picking objects up. The organism appears to move as if it were a quadrupedal mammal, that is, the ventral cavity of its body faces the ground and the dorsal cavity faces the opposite direction. The organism also appears to have a cranial extrusion which is hypothesized to contain its brain. But there is no backing data for this, and the only organs visible on its head are its eyes, of which it possesses four, two on each half of the facial region. Aside from SCP-2764's clear violation of the theoretical limit to a biological organism's size on Earth, its anomalous properties include the following. SCP-2764 possesses the ability to telepathically communicate. The language in which it communicates is dependent on the listener. SCP-2764, however, does not appear to understand any messages it receives in response. SCP-2764's size does not appear to follow Euclidean geometries. That is, one cannot distinguish the organism's true size based on simply looking at it as the creature will often appear to be many times smaller or larger than estimates determine it to be. There is a critical zone which lies approximately 50 kilometers in diameter from SCP-2764. As an individual approaches the bound of this zone from the inside, SCP-2764 will appear to blow up or grow larger. Outside of this zone, SCP-2764 will begin to shrink as the distance from the edge of the critical zone grows larger. SCP-2764's appendages appear to rapidly translocate themselves inexplicably. They will also transpose with each other's positions in space at very rapid intervals, 
Whether this has a relation to the previous anomaly mentioned is, as of yet, unknown. Lastly, and perhaps the most noteworthy, SCP-2764's position will flicker on occasion. Though the frequency of this event is unknown, as it appears to occur on a completely unsystematic basis. The location of SCP-2764 has never flickered further than 25 kilometers, and the object has always flickered back to its original location within 48 hours. Recovery Summary SCP-2764 was discovered by civilian and his team during a detailed survey of the Antarctic terrain observed the anomaly and noted its odd geometries and then returned to base. He shared news of the occurrence to who was the Foundation's investigative researcher in Antarctica at the time, immediately reported this to his superior officer, at which point Mobile Task Force ETA-5 was sent to the Antarctic base to administer amnestics to the local populace and secure a small perimeter around SCP-2764. The initial perimeter was too small, and Commander Mann, who was at the time the commander of Mobile Task Force ETA-5, took it upon himself to investigate the odd creature. Mann's investigation is outlined in the investigative logs that follow. Investigative Log, Days 1 to 3 Day 1 Subject appears to shrink as we get closer to it, which is strange because it was growing until we got to a certain point. Also, its horrifically large tentacles move in a particularly strange manner. I plan to investigate further in the coming days and hopefully do a bit of my own research before they send in the main researchers and guards to take over. Signed, J. Mann. Day 2. Last night, as I tried to sleep, I kept hearing a strange voice. While I cannot currently recall what it was saying, I am sure it had something to do with the beast out there. I personally see no other explanation, as I was alone, and I have no history of hearing voices. Signed, Man. Day 2, Afternoon. I've gathered a few volunteers from the task force. Our job is to secure the anomaly until the main guards can get here, not research it. So I won't be forcing anyone to come along with me. But it's not against my orders to carry out some extra research, and I wouldn't mind having some other folks investigating with me. Always better to have more than one person when it comes to witnessing events. I managed to convince three other guys to come with me. I plan to approach the anomaly very closely, and I made this very clear to everyone as I announced that I needed volunteers. We will begin our exploration tomorrow. Signed, J. Mann. Day 2, Evening. I'm hearing this voice again. It's currently about 10 o'clock p.m. and I'm trying to comprehend what it is saying. It's like it's speaking in English, and I know it is, but just can't work out what it's saying. Signed, Man. Day 3. One of the guys that volunteered came to my tent in the early hours of the morning and said he couldn't go through with it. I told him that it was fine, and I don't blame him. When I asked him why he changed his mind, though, he told me that he'd been hearing something talking to him last night, and suspected that it was connected to the anomaly. When I heard about this, I asked him if he knew what it was saying. He said he couldn't recall exactly what it was saying, but its words evoked a terrible fear in him that he never wished to experience again. When I inquired, he also stated that it was speaking English, but again, he can't recall what it's saying exactly. I then revealed that I, too, had been hearing voices, but had not been terrified by them. This did not convince him to stay on the exploration team with us, but it seemed to comfort him that he was not the only one hearing things. I hope the other two are still in for it. Signed, Man. Day 3, Afternoon. I asked the other guys if they experienced anything out of the ordinary in the past few days, and neither of them said that they had. This is a good thing for me, as I'll have a couple of companions on my research venture, but I also feel like I'll be lying to them if they haven't experienced the voices. I won't tell them about the voices myself, as I fear they'll get spooked out of coming with me. But on the same token, they volunteered to venture very closely to a large, horrible creature, so maybe the story about the voices won't deter them. For now, I'll proceed with discretion. Signed, J-Man. Day 3, Evening. 
We set out around four o'clock in the afternoon, and the other two guys seemed as excited to get closer to the thing as I was apprehensive. Don't get me wrong, I too was excited, it just seemed like they were a little too excited. I guess it isn't out of character for those two. As we got closer, indeed, the thing kept growing smaller, which sort of cooled my anxiety for a bit, but then we started seeing oddities in the snow. Of course, we were dealing with a giant anomaly, but the snow prints just seemed off. There wasn't anything wrong with their pattern, they just seemed out of place. Signed, J. Mann. Investigative Log, Days 4-6 to six. Day 4. We set up camp about a quarter way to the thing. The snow was deep and thick, and to be honest, I was surprised we made it even a quarter of the way. No signs of any voices heard by myself or the other two last night. I'm making sure to be very discreet when I ask them about any oddities. I don't want to put up a red flag. Signed, J-Man. Day 4, afternoon. We covered about half the distance we did yesterday, so I'd say we're close to halfway there. About three-eighths of the way, to be exact. The snow is getting deeper as we approach the thing. It continues to shrink as we approach it, so nothing too out of the ordinary thus far, with the exception of the out-of-place prints in the snow. None of us can work out what creature they originate from. Yesterday, I, I thought they were human tracks. Signed, J. Mann. Day 4, evening. A particularly quiet evening. Nothing notable has occurred. Signed, J. Mann. Day 5. One of the guys reported that he'd heard some strange voices last night. I asked him what they were saying before I revealed that I too had been hearing voices. He told me they were unintelligible. I expected this, but it is now getting quite frustrating that no one can decipher what the voices are saying. Hopefully this expedition to the thing out there will bring us more information. Signed, Man. Day 5, Afternoon. We made very little progress today. We neglected to bring our tissue analyzer from the last tent we set up, so we had to go back. We'll be back on track hopefully by the day after tomorrow. Signed, J. Mann. Day 5, Evening. The evening is quiet once again. I've heard no voices thus far, and the tracks in the snow were absent during our trek back to the old tent today. Signed, J. Mann. Day 5, Midnight. I've been lying awake for some time now, and I've realized that something was horribly out of the ordinary. I recall that as we approached the thing, it got smaller. Well, I would expect it to grow larger as we put more distance between it and ourselves. The problem is, it has not grown larger since this morning when we left to return to the tent. Signed, J. Man. Day 6. The first opportunity I had, I told the other guys about my realization, and I asked what they thought we should do. There was some debate, but ultimately we came to the decision to continue forth toward the creature. On top of this, I can report that we have all now heard the voices. The last guy finally heard them last night. Once again, they were incomprehensible. To no surprise, of course. I hold the belief that we will eventually discover what the voices are saying, but for now, we trek on. Signed, J. Man. Day 6, Afternoon. We made it back to the point we left from yesterday, and decided to continue on for a little while longer. The creature has continued to shrink, even as we traveled the same path we traveled the day before yesterday. The spatial anomaly is starting to get eerily disheartening. Signed, J. Man. Day 6, evening. The creature has disappeared. We all agree that it was due southeast, but we've checked the compasses again and again, but the thing is just no longer there. I hypothesize that it has grown so small that we can no longer see it, but the other two guys think it's just disappeared. Regardless, we all agree to continue in the direction we were headed. We will continue on for a day, and if it has not reappeared at that point, and I see no reason to continue. We'll just have to go back. Signed, J. Mann. Investigative Log, Days 7 to 9. Day 7. Once again, I have heard the voice. 
It is now distinguishable as a single voice as opposed to more than one, as I had previously believed. Some of the words were actually comprehensible and memorable, but they were simple things which actually made no sense when put together. The most distinct words were snow and back. The latter is especially eerie, but I can't think anything of it, as there was no context. When I inquired, the other two guys had also heard the voice and came to the same conclusions as I had. Signed, Man. Day 7, Afternoon. We've continued on for some time now, but it's only 3 o'clock. The creature has reappeared where we expected it to be, and it has grown considerably smaller since we last viewed it. So, I conclude that whatever occurred that affected its position did not affect the shrinkage anomaly. We look to be about three-fourths of the way there now. We will continue till about five o'clock. Signed, J-Man. Day seven, afternoon. It's five o'clock, and two oddities have occurred. One, we have all agreed that the past two hours were definitely a longer duration than the last two hours. On top of space, the creature must incur a temporal anomaly as well. Strangely enough, however, this is the first time any temporal anomaly has been noticed by myself or the other two. Second of all, and most disturbing, are the tracks in the snow. They reappeared last night, but I thought nothing of it, as it is a normality at this point. But the tracks are definitely no longer human at this point, or anything of this earth. The closest thing I can think of is perhaps a squid which walks on land. Considering that the creature out there has tentacular appendages, I suppose this isn't too much of a surprise, but it's still certainly frightening. I am interested in following them, but I want to get to the creature above all else. The main guards were supposed to arrive this morning, but I see no sign of them thus far. I suppose they're just not visible to us, or perhaps the temporal anomaly has affected our view of time. At any rate, I expect to arrive at the creature's location by tomorrow if things go optimally. This expedition has certainly exceeded its expected duration. Signed, J-Man. Day 7, evening. New tracks have appeared around our tent. None of us heard anything out of the ordinary. Myself and one of the guys agreed that those tracks were not there before, but the other guy recalls their existence before this occurrence. We will have to be more mindful of things like this. It's beginning to, it's beginning to become more dangerous than it already was, and I suspect something sinister about these newfound tracks. J-Man. Day 8. We awoke early this morning to get a head start. Once again, new tracks appeared in the snow. This time, none of us had any doubt of their non-existence beforehand. If we do not make it to the creature within two days, we'll abandon the trek and begin to follow the tracks. I fear for our safety at this point. We should be back at the base greeting the new guards and allowing them to take over. J-Man. Day 8, afternoon. It is 12 o'clock and we have made it about 9 tenths of the way there. The creature continues to shrink, but we are definitely very close at this point. We're going to take a brief break and get a few hours sleep in before we continue on. We should lose little time thanks to the temporal anomaly. J-Man. Day 8, midnight. Our reliance on the temporal anomaly's stability has failed us. It is currently midnight, but we only got a couple of hours sleep. I made the decision to continue forth. My fear for my own safety, and more importantly, my fear for their safety has grown to the point where I will have to take full control of this expedition. No more votes. I will take their opinions into consideration, but my word will be final from this point on. Day 8 to 9, transition, early morning. Day 9. As we continued to walk, the voice made a very clear statement to all of us. This is not verbatim, as I could never hope to remember every incomprehensible word this horrible creature has spoken to us, and I apologize for my vagueness, but we got the intended message. Turn back. No doubt at this point, these words are those of the creature we hope to reach. The tone of the voice did not imply any sort of anger or even a hint of territorial jealousy. It sounded more fearful than anything else. Man. Day 9. Once again, the creature has disappeared. I do not credit this occurrence to its shrinkage this time around. 
I am certain that we would still be able to see this behemoth, even at this small size. From this distance, I'm certain of that. To be truthful, I've had enough of this. Supplies are not a problem. We brought plenty to last. I'm just seriously worried about our safety. Not only is the anomaly a main issue, but the Antarctic is a frigid, stark place. We have made it thus far with no serious complaints about the cold, but I worry that I will not last much longer. I have made the decision to lead us in the direction of the tentacular tracks, regardless of whether the creature reappears or not, which I am certain it will. I feel as though we will not make any more progress towards the creature itself, and its eerie statement last night has seriously stricken terror in me after I have given it more thought. Joseph Mann Day 9. Morning. The tracks have led us back to one of our oldest tents, the one at which we left the tissue analyzer. I am thoroughly confused at this. First of all, and most obvious, it took us three hours to travel a distance which previously took us five or six days to travel. Second of all, I noticed no human tracks, as you may have expected to see as a result of our previous trek back to this tent. I will continue to record things in this log to the best of my ability, but my focus has shifted from researching this beast to getting us back to base safely. Joseph Mann. Day 9, before noon, something has been following us this entire time, since day 1. To be frank, I don't care about this thing out there any longer. Something has been following us, and this explains the strange tracks in the snow. This must be why those tracks led us back to our old tent. We were not following them forward. We were following them backward. Joseph. Day 9. Afternoon. I have come to the realization that I am now... alone. Where I once heard the comforting sound of human footsteps crunching the snow behind me, I now hear nothing but the hollow wind and emptiness. I cannot recall at what point those two got away from me, or perhaps at what point I got away from them, but now I am terrified of what is to come. I still have plenty of supplies packed, and as previously stated, food and water will be relatively no issue for at least the next fortnight, but I am alone. The tracks in the snow are now more terrifying than ever, and the voice more horrific than before. Joseph. Leave. Day 9, afternoon. I lost my log in the snow a few hours ago. It was a simple mishap, but I recovered it without any incident. It was a little wet, but otherwise untouched. I just took notice of the one-word entry above. I'm trying to work out at what point I entered this, but I can't recall the point at which I did this for the life of me. Joseph. Day 9, late afternoon. It feels like it's been days since I last updated this log, but I know it cannot have been, as the sun has not set, and I've only eaten one meal since that time. To be frank, day nine, late afternoon, it was a requirement for me to abruptly end my last entry. I heard movement circling me, and upon closer investigation, I saw the beast. The beast itself was circling me. As fast as I could, I approached the thing and skinned a sample of tissue off its torso before it could skitter off with its horrible spastic tentacles. <laughs> the tissue analyzer came up as zero. That is, the tissue analyzer recorded no difference between this creature's tissue and a human's tissue. I will have to run some confidence tests on this because I refuse to believe it until all evidence points to this thing being somehow related to humans. Joseph. Day 9, evening. I've set up a tent. I want to get my mind off this situation for a small while. I've set up a lantern and strewn out a towel on which I will eat dinner and read a book. Then I will get back to the walk, and I will likely skip sleep tonight. Joseph. Day 9, midnight. The book seemed to quiet the voice. It was a peaceful hour, but I knew that I would have to leave as soon as I could. The sooner I get back to base, the sooner they can analyze all of this data from the tissue analyzer and make a sound conclusion about the tissue. My personal belief is that my analyzer is broken, but I've stored the tissue in my pack, so the guys at the base should have no issue running it through again. Joseph. Investigative Log, Days 10 to 11. 
Day 10. I'm almost back to base, but I see some guys coming over the snow hill. I assume they're looking for me, so... I need to warn them not to go any further inward. Joseph. Day 10. Morning. These folks are approaching me awfully slowly. <laughs> They've taken to setting up a camp, which is strange, because if they're looking for me, which is undoubtedly the case, then they are taking an unnecessary break, as I am no more than half a mile away. Day 10, before noon, they made some slow but steady progress towards my location, and then they decided to turn back. I suspect that the spatial anomaly is affecting our distance because, as I stated previously, we're only about half a mile apart. Why are they turning back? I haven't a clue. Day 10, afternoon. A few things. The tracks in the snow have disappeared, as with the voice. I've gotten far enough away from the thing, I assume, and the beast has reappeared. About southeast, exactly where it should be. It's strangely comforting, but I still intend to return to the base. Day 10, evening. The three guys are now approaching me again. They make frequent stops, which I suppose I don't blame them. I must be miles away from their perspective, but it is certain they are coming for me now. I know they can see me. Day 10, midnight. At this point, I have absolutely given up traveling on my own. Progress is heavily stymied by this facial anomaly. I make it barely a few feet after a long day of travel. I'm very scared, <laughs> and I hope these guys can make it to me before my supplies run out, which is now a concern. Day 11. I'm currently very frightened. I want these guys to turn back. I know what's happened. I don't know how it happened, but it did. I will write more on my suspicions once I recover sufficient evidence for them, but for now, I say this for future reference. I do not know how this happened. Day 11, early morning. I recovered a journal in the snow. I know my suspicion to be true at this point. What I discovered in the journal was horrible. I refused to write any of its contents here. I scrawled a warning in it as quickly as I could. I know who will find it. Day 11, late morning. The travelers disappeared and then reappeared again. I tried to approach the lone wanderer in person to notify him to turn back, but this was to no avail, as he was hostile and proceeded to cut a chunk out of my back. <laughs> I had no clue how to react to this. I just ran away. This realization is too horrible for me to state plainly. My suspicions have all been but confirmed. It all adds up. The tissue analyzer coming up a zero, the transition of human tracks in the snow to those tentacular things. Something occurred. The time and space is all messed up due to this beast. I will leave this to the consideration of the reader, whoever finds this log. I hope it is not me this time. Okay. This concludes today's lecture. Thank you for listening if indeed you still are, and you are all dismissed. Goodbye. I would like to give a special thank you to Anvil, Alatreon, Derivative, Zargaron, Professor Puffer, Retalius, Tailored Printers, Clab the Lad, Perpetually Confused Meat Tech Pilot, Signar, Your Local Foundation Agent, Gabriel Hawkins, Nate the Clown, Lost Boy, A Real American Hebrew, Sio Diodemnatus, Eric Corbage, Longinus, The Morrigan, Karim L. Ashmoy, James Saba, and NJ Bojack. If you would like a special thank you at the end of each of my videos, and some other cool stuff as well, visit patreon.com forward slash thevulgan. Thank you. <laughs>